Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we open <clears throat> the word of the Lord in the book of Zephaniah, shall we ask his guidance and his blessing upon us so that we may more clearly understand that which is presented here and that which is presented by his prophet that are relevant for the times in which we live. Shall we now ask his guidance in prayer? <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we know, Father, that we have sinned, that we have not followed in the steps and the paths of those that have gone before us. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction. As we open this chapter, in the words of your prophet Zephaniah, help us that we may understand, that we may follow this counsel, that we may in, indeed be guided where you would have us to walk. Father, we ask that your angels attend us. <clears throat> we ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit, that our minds might be enlightened. That though our minds are dark, that the light from on high might be given so that we might more directly come to understand that which you would have us to know at this time. We ask that your will is done. We follow in the pattern that Christ has, has given us. For we know that you are in heaven and that holy is your name. Help us so that we may do that which is necessary for your coming kingdom. May your will be done. Help us now that if we have sinned against others or others have sinned against us, that these sins may be forgiven so that you may deal with them as necessary. Direct us now in this study. Help us so that we might be guided to understand that which you would have us to know. For this we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we addressed last Sabbath, the third chapter of Zephaniah is what we are going to be reading from today. How many of us were able to take the time this week in order to read from the third chapter of Zephaniah? Heidi did. Bit. I didn't. Okay. As the King James translators addressed this book, they see three divisions verses one, verses eight, and verses 14. The first seven verses relate to a sharp <clears throat> reproof of Jerusalem for, div for diverse sins. Who is Jerusalem represented by today? Any ideas? Yeah, the body of Christ. Can we say at this time that the church is represented by both the church and the movement? That that is? Yes. Okay. 
that is the body of Christ, isn't it? I would say so. Here, from the 8th to the 14th verse, we have an exhortation to wait for the restoration of, of Israel. What is the operative word, the action word, in this explanation? Wait. Exactly. And action of inaction. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm just noticing, you know, wait is then you said it was an action. And yes, that is an is. action. It is. Because we're not the children of Israel at various times told to wait in their tents. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. And then the last section is and to rejoice for the for their salvation by God. So at first, there is a reproof by God. The body of Christ is then to wait for the restoration of Israel, and then they are to rejoice in the salvation that is by and from God alone. Now, as we open this book, the first thing that we read, woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. In the Alternative, it is woe to her that is gluttonous and polluted to the oppressing city. <clears throat> Why is this being referred to in this way if this is of the body of Christ? What is this saying to us at this time? That we're filthy and polluted. Think of Zechariah. Think of the prophecy that he was given of Joshua the high priest. What was filthy and polluted in that prophecy. I'm having trouble recalling that. Was not his garments filthy and polluted his raiment and in this was he not given new raiment was he not given new garments was he not given a new character yeah that's uh that's what we relate the changing of garments is to character. So throughout this, our adversary is accusing us. Our adversary is reminding us of every sin that we have had in our lives. And our adversary stands before God and before Christ to say, they are not worthy. Here is a woe. Woe to her. Woe to her that is gluttonous and polluted. 
whether we're dealing with the church or the movement, the sins are in front of God. Because we are unable to change our garments. We are unable to change our characters without having faith of Christ's ability to do so. She obeyed not the voice. She received not instruction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. How serious is this for us? Very. Well, if we're not if we're not going to obey God's voice, if we're not willing to receive correction, if we're not willing to trust in the Lord, if we are not willing to draw near to God, are these not four steps away from God? As an observation, I would have to say yes. The gospel is a three-step prophetic testing message testified to by the fourth step that we find in Revelation 18. Here we have also four steps. If we choose not to obey the voice, and what yet is the voice? What is it today that we have that speaks to us God's word through the spirit of prophecy the Bible and the spirit of prophecy what else uh, uh, what do you mean what else <laughs> the lines and the lines and the um, common articles do we not have the charts that speak to us? Yes. And of what do the charts speak? Prophecies. What specific prophecy is shown with the charts that many today do not wish to accept? 2520. Uh, the 2300s there, um, I think 165, there's the 13, 13 something. There's, there's, there's lots of them. You have the 2520, you have the 2300. If you have the 2520 and the 2300, do you not also have a message of restoration that is being shown? <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you also not have the 1335? Do you not have the 1290, the 1260? The warning also about entering into alliances that we should not enter, shown by 158? Yeah, the Roman alliance. So if, if we will not obey the voice, whether by scripture, spirit of prophecy, or the charts, if we will not receive the correction, if we do not trust in the Lord, who are we trusting in? Uh, the other guy. And if we are trusting in our adversary, are we also not trusting in man? 
Yep. She drew not to her God. If we are not disciples of Christ, as we were addressing this last Sabbath, for we cannot be disciples if we are not willing to be joined with our brothers and sisters, then we are not drawing near to God. How much more serious can this be? Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw, they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. So can we uh, place that bones thing in what... Uh... Uh, Theodore was speaking of, I think it was even in this paper that uh, that we're proofing right now about the bones being a marker, like a waypoint in a Why calendar. Not? Why not? Works for me now. <laughs> yeah, just, just pointing that out. So in when it has that term, the self same day in the Bible, right? Yeah. Bone day. Right, because the word self same is just the word bone, and and that's because the ancient calendars used boned bone handheld bone calendars. They used these bone pegs to mark off the days of the month, and so uh, the idea it's just a Hebrew expression. So when you talk about a bone day, it's like an anniversary. So, um, but here. Uh, what, well, what you're trying to point out is it's got a time connotation and, a, and right. the bone in there. Right. But they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Um, so that idea of um, and now they, there is not a word for th this whole thing. They gnaw not the bones comes from one um Hebrew word. Well, I guess it's two, two Hebrew words. So they got, um, uh, let's see here. So they got, is it not doing this? Okay. Uh, it's just delayed. So, of course, you got the word not. Um, and then it doesn't have that word estim for bone, it has the word garam which means to be spare or skeleton-like. Um, so so it's, a, it's a different word, but there still might be the same implication. And it's kind of also, you've got evening wolves. Now, evening, yes. of course, is dusk, right? That's that period of time, you know, from, from sunset onward. Um, and uh, the, the wolves are called, uh, comes from the word yellow, Zaib, um, which means wolf, uh, but it means to be yellow. So it's kind of interesting, all these little visual symbols that we have here. Um, so... And yet there is one that neither of you chose to touch upon. Um, which one's that? The roaring lion? Exactly. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at those two. So you got roaring, and that's the word uh, sha'ag, which means to rumble or moan. And then, of course, the lion is are. Where else have we studied about roaring lions in this last week? Yeah, we were dealing with um, the line that roars against um, Samson. Samson yeah. Here, her princes within her are roaring lions. The leaders within 
her are as a roaring lion. And what did the roaring lion do in what we have studied with this with Samson? Yeah. Well, the interesting thing here is this is F and I 3 3. So sorry about that. Um, yes. This word within means the center. Good. And why would that be important with this? I'm sorry, what word? Within. Uh -huh. And why would that be important for what we are studying now? Well, we're dealing with the, the, the uh, Achaia's chronology, the way marks. Has it not been the central point for many years that the church has rejected the seven times of Leviticus 26? Well, rejecting really the cross. Well, I was, my, my thought was this. What is the, the, the entire premise of Leviticus 26? Well, I mean, it's it's dealing with the progressive destruction of four, the four generations. But is it not also presenting before us the blessings of keeping God's law and the curses if we choose not to? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So are we choosing to be blessed or are we choosing to be cursed? when we choose to reject the message of Leviticus 26. Oh, uh, no brainer, rejection. So when we are choosing to reject that message, we are choosing to be cursed. Yeah, that's what it seems like. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 22, I think he's got the same 22, 27 says her princess is in the midst of midst thereof are like wolves raving raving at the prey to sled blood and to destroy souls to get this on this honor gain it's 27 or 22 amen well stated brother Now, through this, Zephaniah is also supported by Jeremiah. Here is Jeremiah. I spake unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. This hath been thy manner from thy youth, that thou obeyest not my voice. Jeremiah continued, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. And what are we to return to? Is it not the old paths? Oh, uh, yes. Now, okay. Now, what Brother William was so aptly describing is seconded also from the book of Micah. So Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-seven, 27. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. But Micah says it this way, Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob, and princes of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment and pervert all equality. They build up Zion with blood, and Jerusalem with iniquity. 
the heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money, yet they will lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. This is the church. This oh, yeah. is the church, the apple of God's eye. Are we not the church? Oh, yeah. Yet what is being said here? Well, it's a rebuke. Yes, it is a rebuke. It is a great rebuke. And who is being rebuked? Jerusalem. All of us. All of us, yes. We are Jerusalem. <clears throat> now we have Habakkuk. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteneth to eat. It has been interesting to observe. That so many today are willing to dine upon garbage and speak as to how delicious it is. It's a sad thing that there are those that will not accept union with other brothers and sisters that they are willing to cast them out because they choose the curses rather than the blessings that they would rather dine upon the flesh of the swine than to understand the mercies of God's true love Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. What does this verse say to you? How does this speak to you today? In these situations, there are prophets that are willing to give a peace and safety message. Oh, you don't need to worry about the message of Leviticus 26. You don't need to worry about the call to judgment of the 20. There lies the treachery. Exactly. There also lies the pollution. Mm -hmm. Three steps. Treachery, pollution, and violence. It is not a pretty picture. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame.
when we look upon this of every morning from the Hebrew, the alternate Hebrew, they would say morning by morning. Boker, boker, repeated. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. As this he's showing, we have the second angel's message. That's what it looks like. That brings the, his judgment to light. If we are not willing to give glory to God, his judgment will fall upon us. For if we cannot be benefited by the first and the second angel's message to fear God and give glory to him, we indeed will come to his hour of judgment, and his judgment will bring all sins to light. Does he fail? The questions to who? Well, does who? God fail? Oh, no. <laughs> but the unjust, those that are unwilling to be benefited by the first and the second angel's message, knoweth no shame. We are told what will happen. We are shown what will happen. But there are many today that continue to walk in their own righteousness, believing I'm a member. I don't need this message. My membership is all I need. Therefore, I can continue living the way I currently want to live without needing to give up my sins. Truly, the unjust knoweth no shame. Here again, when we look at this portion, when we're doing violence to the law, Ezekiel in, its, in his prior verse to 2227 made it very clear that her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them. Do we wish to profane God? Well, that's, that's, that's not our intention, but a lot of times it's, it's usually what we do. Okay. Now, here again. I, I've also got to say something here. Please. Um, every time you, you talk about these people, you know, and the, the uses of this stuff in here, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really see anybody but me. Um. I keep seeing me when you say that stuff. I, I keep seeing, you know, it's, it's, it's me. It's I'm the troublemaker. I am the, the, the problem. And so I just keep asking God, you know, to, to, to put that, his character on me. I mean, cause <laughs> I obviously don't have it. <laughs> I think I've said many times before that you cannot 
point a finger without having three fingers pointing right back at yourself. Absolutely. And I'm totally with that. And that's why I see me. I don't, I don't see anybody else. I just keep seeing me. You know, and it's hard to, you know, to accept these things, but, you know, you just have to accept them because it's true. Christ came to the temple. Mm. And there were two men that were there before him, in front of Christ and in front of the disciples. One of them expounded upon all that he was doing to the benefit of the church and the nation. And how he was so much better than his brother that stood beside him. And the other could not even look up. His comment was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Christ asked his disciples, which one of them went away justified? The one with the hanging head. Which one of them took the first step in salvation, justification? The one with the hanging head. Exactly. <clears throat> Which one was benefited by the first and the second angel's message? I, I would say the one with the hanging head again. So that's three times now. Yes. Now. So that's where, <laughs> that's what. And that is what cheers me up. All right. Right. I mean, and that's, that's, that's the only, because all I keep seeing is these three fingers pointed back at me. Comment from the chat is that Ellen White wrote that the penitent felt too unworthy to stand near anyone in the temple. We are being given the opportunity to learn more of Christ, to become righteous by faith. Is this not the subject of our Friday night studies? Is this chapter not giving us examples of what it means not to be righteous by faith so that we can learn from mistakes? Now, I, I got to tell you, you know, um... I have been educated in many fashions, but the one that seems to work the best is when I break something or yeah. when I screw something up because um, I'm the one that has to fix it. And, but it, it, it also tells me, you know, the things that I, I need not to do so I, so I can extend that life a bit longer. <laughs> In this entire situation, when we are looking at this, when the Lord is in the midst of this, if we look at this carefully, we find later in this same chapter, the Lord has taken away the judgment. He has cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. 
The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Now we have Micah 311. The heads thereof judge for reward. And the priests thereof teach for hire. And the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Is the Lord doing this for gain? As man would do. Uh, just the gaining of souls. So is he doing it because we've hired him to do this? Negative. Uh, it's a love thing. But yet those that claim to be prophets are divining for money. Are we choosing today to lean upon the Lord? Are we choosing today to be restored unto him? I have cut off the nations, their towers, their corners are desolate. I made their streets waste, that none passeth by, their cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever I punished them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. The scriptures speak plainly in regard to the spirit that prevails in the last days. All who have ears to hear and hearts to understand the language of scripture can see that its prophecies are being fulfilled. Manuscript 103, 1893. Of the world today, God says, woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till tomorrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. How many times within the book of Judges do we find that light persons have been hired by those that are not walking according to the will of God. Are we to listen to those light people? Are we to listen to those that have polluted the sanctuary, that have done violence to the law of God? Well, what do no. you say? No, okay. we're not supposed to listen to them. But again, we often do. Now, in this situation, if we are choosing to listen to those that have polluted the sanctuary, that have done violence to the law of God, that have opposed the law of God. 
that have set aside the law of God? Are we to acclaim them as being learned men? Well, that would seem unwise. Many times I have observed those that are saying, it's not a problem. I don't want you to feel bad about transacting business upon the Sabbath because it's done to support a ministry. I don't want you to feel bad about going out to eat on the Sabbath. For the people where you're going, they don't observe the Sabbath, so it's no big deal for them. How many times by our decisions are we doing violence to the law? Well, hopefully not as much now as we were before. Okay. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I have made their streets waste, that none more path passeth by. Their cities are destroyed, so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwellings should not be cut off. However, I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. The corruption among the governments of earth reveals the character of its rulers who have not the wisdom of God. Everywhere there is confusion and perplexity. The world is like a troubled sea which cannot rest. The theories and speculations of men will not bring peace. They will bring only additional confusion and perplexity. That voice alone which commanded the light to shine out of darkness, which said, let there be light, and there was light, could speak peace to the troubled world today. Genesis 1 verse 3. But God is left out of the counsels of men. So just an observation. Yes. Um, I've been noticing. I think you picked up on it as well. Uh, and Theodore for sure. Um, so as we've been studying the, um, the sermons produced by. Um, Brother Jones. Yes, Brother Jones. Um, I've noticed that a lot of her manuscripts that were dated in the same years, basically, of these conferences and whatnot, that um, she seems to be supporting um, through her, her, her manuscripts what Jones has been uh, preaching at these conferences. Most certainly. I mean, I, I, there's, I can definitely see it. I have to go through it several more times to be able to point every little thing out, but uh, it, my mind is, is seeing these things. Most assuredly, she was very much supporting that which Brother Jones had had to say.
It's interesting that in the aftermath of the Minneapolis General Conference session, Sister White. What's this, the 86 one? 1888. Because okay, 18, yeah, yeah. in 1886, she was yet in Switzerland. In the aftermath of the 1888 general conference session in Minneapolis, Sister White, Brethren Jones and Wagner combined together to give a series of meetings throughout the country. One of the comments that Mrs. White makes is throughout all of this, that these three were surprised because great offerings and greater tithes poured in, even though the subject of this had not been addressed. This occurred when this was unbidden. This was one of the things that scared the leadership of the General Conference more than anything else. Because if the tithe, if the money was going to follow this message, they were afraid that they were going to lose their grip and their control over the membership. Hmm. Evil surmisings, huh? Exactly. Now, what were they thinking? Well, I mean, what were they thinking? If they just allowed it to continue, a reformation unlike any other would have occurred. You think? Yet, they chose not to accept the righteousness of Christ. I think I know what drove uh, Jones the other way. I mean, with all that rejection, uh, after all that work, I mean, over a, a around a decade, right? And, and and just to watch it go in a swirly down the porcelain um, tank. Okay. I mean, I could see why he why he you know. Went sideways. Well, consider this. <clears throat> Brother Jones knew that the message that he and Brother Wagner had been given was of God because Ellen White testified so. The word of the prophet was that this was a message most precious that was sent not by her, but by Dr. Wagner and Brother Jones. They knew that this was God's church, his denominated people. Yet, this denominated people chose to reject the message in full. How can you be the denominated people of God if you are not going to follow God's law and God's teaching? Well, um, you know, we can we could sit here and talk about that all day long, but uh, by and large, they rejected the message. And they rejected the messengers. Well, as well, and that's and that's like I've been noticing it's that's been the biggest problem uh, historically. Uh, Theodore kind of touched on it in his 
in his uh, the work that I'm proofing right now. Um, the way the timing of the wave sheet offering, uh, he made a comment that was in relationship to this, and I uh, can't recall it completely, but um, it was a pretty good explanation of, of what was going on. Sure. Here again. Genesis 6, verse 12. And God looked upon the earth and beheld, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Here we have numbers. 6 and 12. And if we rearrange those just a little bit, we have 126. We have a warning here because God looked upon the earth and the earth was corrupt. Mankind was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 10. For ages, this prayer taught by Jesus to his disciples has been ascending to God from contrite hearts. It will surely be answered. It will certainly be answered. It will, yes, be answered. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation 11.15. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Zechariah 3, 6, and 7. How many are turning from the lost ones with disdain? I thank God that the medical missionaries are finding the lost sheeps. When one of these is recovered, and the cry goes forth, rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep which was lost. Angels in heaven catch the glad strain from the weary but rejoicing shepherd. And the Lord himself joins in the anthem of joy and gladness. Luke 15, 6 and 7. The song will be sung. The Lord Thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3.17. Should not these words inspire the indolent to obtain a living connection with the source of all power? Will they not be laborers together with God? Hear what God, your great teacher, has to say to you. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. What is the instruction that is given here? 
what is the action that we are to take? Uh, wait. <laughs> is that something that we look forward to doing? <laughs> Not really. Yet we are being shown this is what the Lord would have us to do. Hang on for a second. How much more can we deal in this situation? We are being told to wait upon God. Why? Well, uh, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea because um, isn't it, uh, haven't we determined that uh, it's, He's the one that's going to do it. It's not going to be any of us. When he takes the work into his hands, things are going to be accomplished in a manner that we have no concept about. Pretty much. In Psalms 27, we are told. Did you catch that uh, chat Iran just put up? Very nice waiting, according to Ellen White, is measuring the time. How appropriate. How apropos for this time period. How much more defined can it be for us? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait. I say on the Lord. Then in Psalms 37, 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Well, that word wait now has new meaning to me. And as Solomon said in Proverbs 20, 22, interesting, is it not that we are going to read this proverb on December 31st of 2022? Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. As we measure the time, as we observe the time, are we not able to understand and hear the footsteps of an approaching God? As we see here in the book of Joel, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And when we look finally, Zephaniah 1.18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Here again. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy.
for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one shoulder. When Christ ascended into heaven, were the disciples united in purpose? I'm sorry, question again? When Christ ascended into heaven, were the disciples united in purpose? No. So. No. I agree. They didn't. They didn't come into purpose until uh, Pentecost, wasn't it? Which is fifty days later. No. Christ had taught them for close to forty days. He ascended into heaven. The disciples for nine days went into the upper room. On the 10th day, at the Feast of Weeks, which we now call Pentecost, <clears throat> they had come into unity. But how did they come into unity? Um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit could not occur without the confession of sins. Okay, yeah. And without them becoming united with their brethren. Right, which was under their control. Is this not the same as it is for us today? I would we say the keep, parallel is really cool. We keep stating, and we hear this all of the time within the movement and within the church, that we are praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we are unwilling to do that which is necessary. How can we be praying for something? when we are not willing to do what is within our power. An excellent question. Here is the promise of God. For then I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. We are no different than the disciples. Yet, we cannot be a disciple and seen as being a disciple if we are not in harmony with our brothers and sisters. How much more does Mrs. White need to tell us this before we start to listen? I don't know, Dwight. That's a question I keep asking myself. We are living in a time where we observe and we understand that this world is soon to end. How can we know that the world is soon to end and not do that which is incumbent upon us?
if we are praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and we are unwilling to be in unity with our brothers and sisters, are we not like those that are uttering lying words? We want something, but we're not willing to do what we're asking for. When the disciples went, went into that upper room, after having been with Jesus for that time after the crucifixion, There was one among them that felt that he had been such a sinner that he had no part in the work. Three times Christ came and gave an admonition to Peter. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Peter felt that he had dishonored his Lord so greatly that he could have no part in his kingdom. Yet, Christ when he was giving the admonitions and giving the instructions, tell your brothers and Peter. He was showing Peter how he was yet included. He was showing Peter that he had a part yet to play. Was this Galilean fisherman in complete agreement with Simon Zelotus? The zealot, the one that was always seeking the overthrow of the Roman authority? I don't think so. Was Peter in full agreement with Matthew, the tax collector? I'd have to say no on that one, too. Was Peter coming into an understanding with John the Beloved, who would eventually become John the Revelator, about the love of Christ and how that love can change a person. God is That's seeking. God is seeking right now for a people that are willing to work together. that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. You cannot move a heavy load unless you're really willing to put effort into it. Here, you had to put the shoulder to the wheel, the shoulder to that load. You had to be of one mind, of one accord, to make this happen. The disciples had to wait in the upper room, but they also needed to do that 
which was in their power to do. Peter came to the Savior and he asked the question, how many times am I to forgive my brother? Seventy. As many as seven times? Yeah. And, what was, and what was Christ's response? Yeah, he kept, he, put, he multiplied it. And when we multiply that, those numbers together, what do we come out with? What, for what is 70 times 7? I don't know. Okay, one at a time, please. Four ninety. Exactly. Four hundred and ninety is something else that is very important for us at this time. Mm. And this is something that we will need to address soon. For beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. God is being patient with us. We have a work to do. We have a work that can be done. A work that is completely incumbent upon us. Are we willing to undertake that task? I find it very interesting. And yeah. going, through, going through this with the book of Zephaniah, how many times the translators, when they are putting just, just these simple things together, would then again go back into the book of Isaiah. I, as, we're, as we're scrolling through this, the various verses that they used as references from the book of Isaiah are very pointed. In that day shall the cities of, in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Coming down a few verses. In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hereto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. In Isaiah 60, verses 4, 5, and 6, Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They shall come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then shall thou see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring golden incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar 
shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with the acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these that fly as a cloud and are as doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall what? Wait for me. And the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and thy king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gate shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the, the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, these nations shall be utterly wasted. As Malachi stated, in Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. And the example that we are given in Acts 8.27. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an Enoch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. <laughs> uh. as it is noted again in the chat Isaiah 187 again July 18th is yet be being provided with another reference that this is a way mark for us to observe. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride. And thou shalt no more be haughty in my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The promise that is given here. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and a poor people. Is very different from the admonition that is provided to the church of Laodicea. What is the warning that is given to Laodicea? How does Laodicea view itself? Hmm. 
rich and increased in goods and knoweth not death. Okay. If we were to look at Revelation 3 beginning in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of, La of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have needed of nothing, and knowest that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked." Laodicea is the antithesis of an inflicted and a poor people. For the afflicted and the poor do not have fine garments. They do not have a wonderful outward character. They are poor but they are not blind. These afflicted and poor people, for they see their condition, they know their condition. Laodicea is blind. It does not understand how wretched they truly are. If we are not willing to be disciples, If we are not willing to stand under Christ's banner, there's only one other banner under which we are standing. That is our choice at this time. There's a choice that we are being given. Are we willing to do the work currently before us, the work that we are called to do? It's not an easy work. It's not something that we find very tasteful to do. We think it's so much easier to be out giving a prophetic testing message rather than having to be united with our brothers and sisters. We don't want to confess our sins. We don't want to have to open up our thoughts of what has been going on. We don't want to bear our souls to show just how wretched we really are. Yet is this not what God has called upon us to do? That we are to be like the disciples were in the upper room, praying and confessing our sins, becoming united so that the Holy Spirit can be poured out. Think of this today. We are the reason that the Holy Spirit has not been poured out. The bride has not chosen to make herself ready for the wedding. Has this not been going on long enough? Has this not been going on long enough since 1888? 
isn't it about time for the bride to make herself ready? We will be returning to much of this this next week. Any further thoughts, questions, or comments from what we have covered so far today? Yeah, um, well, the last little bit here just given me a lot to reflect on. Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we need your wisdom and we need your strength for this time. We have great need of you. The work that is presented before us is the work that is necessary and only we can do this if we have your strength and your wisdom. We ask, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Father, that you will guide us and direct us. Help us today in all ways and in all things. May your will be done in our lives, in this movement, within the church. We ask, Father, for strength to resist temptation. And we ask to be delivered from the evil that we have caused. Help us that we may be prepared to give a message of your coming kingdom, but first that we may be reunited in spirit and in truth with our brothers and sisters. For this, Father, we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.